This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome. My name is Pradeep Chibber. I'm the director of the Institute of International Studies. And I'd like you to like to welcome you to what I think is a great event, and that is the release of Harry's book, Political Awakening, Conversations in History. There's only one thing that can be said about Harry Chrysler, just one, among many things which I'm sure other people know more about than I do. Even before I arrived at Berkeley, I'd heard of Harry Chrysler, and in the field of international politics, and in the field of international studies, not in the academic realms where I work, where there are many iconic figures at Berkeley, but people who reach across the university, people who have a wide public audience, there is only one iconic figure, and that is Harry Chrysler. And I can say that, looking at you in your, in your face, and say that is, without a doubt, absolutely true. I think Harry is widely acknowledged to be a leading public intellectual, and I think his conversations in history and the interviews he has done are actually a testament to it. You should watch his interviews, and as I watched them over the years, I said to him the other day, Harry, Terry Gross, better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> so without much ado, Harry. Gross. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I've entitled my talk, uh, Not a Book into a Movie, but Videos into a Book. And I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, uh, tell you the story of conversations and, and, and explain how a book uh, emerged. Uh, uh, I started this series in 1982 as a videotaping of visitors to the Institute of International Studies. Uh, after 28 years uh, and 485 interviews, uh, uh, one hour taped interviews, uh, we now have an archive uh, and a, a nationally broadcast satellite television program via, U via UCTV and we're broadcast nationally on uh, YouTube. Uh, and when I'm preparing this talk and was preparing the book, I was actually taken aback somewhat by the interviews that I've done. Uh, what I want to emphasize in this is that I love doing uh, what I was doing, and uh, I had the support uh, of uh, directors of the Institute of International Studies uh, through the years, uh, beginning with Carl Rosberg, Michael Watts, uh, 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 Laura Tyson, uh, Steve Weber, and, and now uh, Pradeep Chipper, uh, our new director. And, and that has been uh, very important. Uh, and, and the other thing I want to say is that my, my original mission statement, which I developed myself, was to share with the public Berkeley's distinction uh, as a global forum for ideas. It's just that simple. And uh, now when I look back, and I'm doing that in, in creating the book and uh, uh, doing talks like this, uh, in the archive now are 40 UC faculty members 14 Nobel laureates, including laureates for physics, chemistry, peace, and literature, Pulitzer Prize winners, including Steve Cole, ne Neil Sheehan, Jane Mayer, William Fath, David Kennedy, and James McPherson, MacArthur Genius Award winners, former political prisoners, including the Russian Natan Sharansky, the South African Albi Sachs, the Iranian Akbar Ganji, the Nigerian Woli Stoyinka. Uh, movie directors, including Oliver Stone, Robert Wise, uh, the Japanese New Wave director Masahiro Shinoda. 
uh, former congressmen and senators, including Abner Mikva, James Leach, Ron Dellums, Alan Simpson, former political leaders and advisors, Chris Patton, Neil Kinnock, Lauren Fabius, Shirley Williams, Anita Groton, uh, Massimo Dilema, uh, a uh, the former prime minister of Italy, and interestingly enough, the president of Italy today, Giorgio Napolitano, was one of my first interviews. Uh, back then, he was the third ranking member of the Euro Communists. I assume he, he no longer holds that position and is president of Italy. Uh, I cross political spectrums, so I have interviews with everybody from Norman Podoritz uh, and William Rusher, the founding publisher of uh, uh, the National Review, to Noam Chomsky and E.P. Thompson. I have uh, uh, one of the rare interviews with a former director of the CIA uh, uh, and with a former uh, deputy director of the CIA. The director was John McCone. The deputy director was Bobby Inman. Uh, I have a lot of uh, generals and admirals, including two former commanders of the Central Command and former presidents of Princeton, MIT, Cornell, Michigan, University of California, Dartmouth, uh, and Wisconsin. I just uh, say this, not in a bragging way, but just to say I just like doing what I was doing. And I'm, I'm actually somewhat shocked when I go back and, 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 and see uh, all of this material. And so uh, in addition to my directors, I think it's very important. This is about Berkeley and what Berkeley was in the last 38 years and hopefully will continue to be, uh, which is uh, an extraordinary uh, crossroads uh, for ideas uh, and thinking, not just the faculty here, but, but also people uh, who pass through. And uh, when I was 10 years into this project, uh, I made a video and I found it recently uh, and I'm going to show it because what, what I was doing was mining the streets of the campus, so to speak, and I was finding gold nuggets everywhere. And, uh, uh, and this video, I think, will show you what I realized that I was doing. So. But I kept saying to President Kennedy, I'm not qualified, and he kept saying, well, you are, there's nobody more qualified than I know of, and so on. And finally, he said, and this was a remarkable line, it was just typical, Ken. He said, you know, there's no school for presidents either. But I didn't have classified information about atomic bombs, and I could uh, talk about them as freely as I wanted, I thought. After my first talk, uh, I think uh, the second day after my first talk, uh, an FBI man turned up in my office and said, uh, how did you, who gave you information about how much uh, plutonium or uranium-235 there is in an atomic bomb? And I said, nobody. <laughs> I figured it out. I, in those days, uh, along with everybody else, uh, had ideas until Roosevelt had spoken, and then I automatically uh, accepted his. And. Uh, through the whole structure of uh, the New Deal Washington, including the war years, uh, the greatest mark of pride was to be a Roosevelt man. You are not omniscient. You do not know everything. And once you have the humility to accept that one, even if you're a PhD, it doesn't matter even if you've got a Nobel Prize. There's always something new you can learn. And you can learn that from a person from any station in life. One of the failures that could come from any leadership is when a leader considers himself having the monopoly of all knowledge. We were young reporters in Vietnam in that first period, 62, 63. And these generals would, would tell us how they were winning the war. We thought they were lying to us. Mm -hmm. We thought that they were, we, we considered these, these statements of fatuous optimism to be insults to our intelligence. We thought that they, they, they regarded us with contempt because mm -hmm. we were reporters, and they were just saying, we thought they had a grip on reality. When I got the Pentagon Papers, 
I began to realize that just a moment, <laughs> maybe these people believed these delusions. And then when I began to research the book, I discovered that it was absolutely true. Uh, the nine years of my days uh, in, in the United States uh, uh, make uh, my way of thinking uh, very much oriented uh, toward democracy uh, and the freedom, liberty, and, and so on. So that uh, the, my education at Berkeley uh, the, uh, uh, has left a very strong imprints uh, in my thinking and behavior even today. But there is certainly no reliable ally anymore in that sense, and that the Soviet Union apparently knows that rather well, and that there's more and more cracks of light appearing the more you look at Charter 77, Solidarność, and all those movements. And I think we have to learn that those people have really shown us that they take a much higher risk to do what we're doing, and that makes us also sometimes very feel very strong, because we know that they are, with every moment that we have little success, are getting a little bit more air, even though their risk is much higher. The great thing about Bunch was that uh, everybody who dealt with him, even when you disagreed with Bunch, uh, you knew he was absolutely fair and honest. He never would tell anyone something that wasn't true. And he understood, I think better than anybody I've ever seen, the, the sort of concerns and fears and worries that are on the minds of people in conflict. So that he could come up with ideas which would suddenly meet mm -hmm. all of the fears these people hadn't been willing to express in public. And the result was he, he enjoyed the most astonishing confidence from the people he dealt with. And I think if anybody ever deserved the Nobel Peace Prize, he did. I have this strange experience now of sort of young, ambitious graduates coming to see me, you know, kids in their early 20s, and saying, um, Mr. Gartner, where should I go? You know, tell me the horse that is going to be the winner. <laughs> <laughs> As if you could make this choice like a stockbroker choosing a good stock. That is absolutely not how I made the choice. I followed my nose. I went to Berlin, I went to Central Europe because it interested me, because there was a big question I wanted to find the answer to, because I cared passionately about it. And it just happened to become the center of European history. One of my um, visions is a return of a sort of Gladstone approach to politics. And I'm thinking of Gladstone the campaigner who gave long, long lectures, I'm almost tempted to say, to his constituency about distant parts of the world, explaining the complications of these distant parts. And while it's very unpopular these days in view of fundamentalism and protectionism and the desire for homogeneity to say so, I think the great counter-cyclical task which the moral minorities have is to spread the message of complexity. The world isn't simple, nor should it be simple. It's rich because it's complicated. Let us somehow manage to live with that. So uh, when I say I was finding gold, I think you, you get a sense of that uh, uh, from, these, uh, uh, from these interviews. Uh, now, uh, uh, what I would like to do is explain how this developed over time how I developed my craft uh, and, and how my, what I was doing related to the new technologies that were emerging. And then uh, I'll, I'll spend the most of the time talking about what I've done in the book, how the book came about, and, uh, and do some reading from the book. And then we will have uh, uh, books uh, uh, for sale. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in 1982, as executive director of the Institute of International Studies, uh, I started the series. And the idea was to expose students and the public to uh, the reflections of distinguished men and women who pass through Berkeley on a daily basis. Sharing the university's distinction as a global forum for ideas to a, with a larger audience. Uh, in the beginning, we placed uh, uh, this material in a video library in the undergraduate library, and we were making these tapes available to uh, uh, access channels. And I want to start here right at the beginning with what I was learning. And, and I think one of the things I came to see rather quick, I wasn't a newsmaker, A. 
This isn't about making news, but it's about capturing in an hour conversation who a person is. If, if you look at this tape, I just showed you uh, four of these people have passed away. Uh, Derendorf very recently, uh, and uh, Galbraith, McNamara, uh, and Petra Kelly uh, are, are no longer with us. So, so it, it, what, what, what is I think exciting is it's, it's a moment in time. This is not 10 hours of interviews that you could do with any one of these people. It's really, well, if I prepare well, you know, what can I get out of these people that, that would uh, uh, be important for opening up their ideas to people, uh, whether they're still with us uh, or not. Uh, interestingly enough, this came about, I was explaining this to Harold Smith just now, we, in the early 80s, we had an event upstairs in our conference room, and it was on uh, the arms race in Europe. Reagan was building up, we were putting new missiles in, and we had a meeting, and it was closed to the public. Uh, and it was a, a private lunch, and, and there were four Nobel Prizes in the room. Linus Pauling was there, so he had two of them. You know, there were, uh, Charlie Towns was there. Uh, there were distinguished scientists uh, from all over the campus. There were our IR specialists. And it was just really an, an intense, uh, interesting conversation that, uh, that nothing in the public domain was could be compared with this. And so it was at that point that I got the idea to, well, what can we do about taping this? When I talked to the media services, they said, well, we could tape a lecture. And uh, despite the fact that we're taping this lecture now, I, I was convinced that that wasn't the way to go. And so they said, well, we, you can bring them over and we'll interview, interview them. And, and uh, I started doing that. And uh, so initially they said, well, uh, do you want us to edit it? And I said, well, what's involved in editing? And they said, money. <laughs> and I said, well, I didn't have any money. And for many years, we had no budget for this. So then I honed a craft, which I will uh, describe uh, in a minute. Uh, 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 so uh, what, what, what I am doing now with these interviews is a lot of preparation on my own time, not university time. And I, I came to realize that in being prepared, the constraint of the, of the time became an opportunity to probe. Uh, the other insight I had was about getting into some background information about the person and the way that could be attractive to people. So as, as I'm developing this uh, skill, this craft, uh, uh, over the next two decades, new technologies were developed. So here I am doing this, I like to do it, uh, but uh, suddenly people were walking up, c coming into my door or seeing me or seeing one of my videos and saying, hey, I have a new technology where we can do something about this. So over the next two decades, as new technologies were developed, the archive became much more. It became a resource for many broadcast media, including cable, satellite television, the World Wide Web, YouTube video, and podcasting. And when these technologies emerged, the audience grew exponentially. And it is quite extraordinary. And it, 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 you don't realize it until certain things happen. And let me give you a couple of examples. In the late 90s, I interviewed Albie Sachs. He is a, 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 a a white uh, living in South Africa. He was on the board of the uh, of uh, Mandela's party. He was a victim of a terrorist attack and lost an arm. Uh, he had a stage on uh, 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 the London stage. Had a play on the London stage describing his ordeal as a political prisoner. And he came here, and I interviewed him. And uh, with a lot of these people, they didn't know who I was. They couldn't figure it out, but they saw that I was prepared and so on. And then he, he, he after, several months later, he wrote back and he said, you know, I'm going all over the world. People are raising their hands in an audience, and they're asking me questions. And I'm sort of standing there, and I'll say to them, where are you coming from? How did you come to ask me that question? And they would say, I saw your interview on Globetrotter. 
And uh, the, he told me this in the late 90s, as all of this was just beginning. And, and you know, coming from Albie Sachs, he said, you globalized me, which, you know, isn't true, but, but it was a nice compliment. And, and I've discovered that this is true with others. So whether it's, it's Neil Ferguson or, or whoever, you know, they tell me they go all over the world and after they've done an interview with me, uh, Chris Patton has told me this. So there's something about this interview, it's accessibility. And I think the way it draws people in to an interest in what the person is uh, saying. And, and, and this works not just from you know, these, these very important people, but the other day I received this letter and it comes in a beautifully written hand and it's from Paris and uh, it just was in my mailbox the other day and it's dated April 18th and I'm going to read it. Dear Mr. Chrysler, I thought about writing you for several years to tell you what an exemplary program Conversations with History is. I must say you are in my estimation the best interviewer. I've been listening to your program for several years and I'm so grateful to you for providing me access to such a wealth of knowledge. It's a fascinating continuing education, but then you probably know that. You no doubt receive many expressions of appreciation for your program and I want to be counted among those many. Thanks so much, Mr. Chrysler, for letting me eavesdrop on hours of intelligent conversation. It's an ongoing pleasure. You're the best. And it's signed. I have no idea who this is, but it's just somebody out there, you know, in Paris uh, who, who's watching this. So the reason I'm saying this is, is not to compliment myself, but just to give you a sense of the power of this technology. The other thing I want to point out is that as I moved from international studies to across disciplines, what I had to do was be interviewing, you know, Nobel laureates and others in fields that before I started preparing for the interview I knew nothing about. And I think that became a strength, basically, because when they said something that uh, I didn't understand, it suggested to me that I better have them explain it again because there was a good chance that some of my audience was not understanding what was being said. So, so that, that, that is another example of how I was, I got in the translation business. And so I've interviewed a lot of scientists and I have to become familiar with what they're doing and, and I have to figure out ways to, to capture their excitement about what they're doing and make it interesting to people so they will in turn, you know, become interested in, in that subject. Uh, our conversations would occur as the tape rolls and editing was in, were not within our budget. Over time, I learned to work with this limitation by ex preparing extensively. I would read and study whatever relevant material I could get hold of, including books, monographs, vita, and newspaper articles. I was then positioned to be not only an on-camera host who was responsive to what was said, but also a thoughtful and engaged guide to a unique intellectual journey. I allowed the conversation to be moved in unexpected directions. My interviewing style invited the guest to be frank and honest as he or she recounted ideas that were central to his or her own personal narrative. And my questions were intended to elicit very personal and human responses, which I hope resonated with the audience. As an informed guide, I became an ideal representative of the interests and concerns of an audience that wants to learn more about the world. And so I was preparing, and then if somebody, and I will use the example of Robert McNamara, who is one of the more difficult people to interview. I like to tell the story that with McNamara, if you ask him, well, what do you think of today's weather? He, his response is, well, you're really asking me three questions. <laughs> I will now answer those three questions. So McNamara came here. He's a regents lecturer. He was uh, lecturing all over the campus, and I re went around and listened to him everywhere. And uh, what was really fascinating, in addition to all the issues I knew I wanted to discuss with him, Vietnam, nuclear weapons, and so on, uh, was what an idealist he was. He was a Roosevelt liberal who had gone here to school. And one of the things that struck me was, uh, why did he ever leave the university? He uh, was at the Pentagon, then he was at the Harvard Business School. And it struck me that if he had stayed at Harvard, you know, it would have been a very different story. He might have uh, uh, 
done harm to some graduate students, but maybe not to a, a wider audience. And so I thought that was an interesting question to ask. So I said to him, why did you leave Harvard and go to Ford? And he looked at me and he said, well, my wife and I got polio. And her case was serious, and I didn't have money to pay for the treatment. And I recovered, and I needed the money. And I don't think he had ever sort of revealed that before, and it was subsequently in fog of war, but I think that Errol Morris had seen my interview. So those are the kinds of things you stumble on. Uh, and, and so what, what I came was with preparation with a commitment to finding out about their background, but then letting them explain to the world, you know, the ideas that really mattered to them. Uh, in my approach, I was influenced by two heroes from the 1950s. When I was growing up in Galveston, Texas, I regularly watched Edward R. Murrow's Person to Person and Walter Cronkite's You Were There. In the early years of television, Murrow took you into the homes of the movers and shakers in the arts and politics to explore their personalities. Cronkite took you back into history where newsmen would interview actors playing historical figures. Both Cronkite and Murrow emphasized the importance of personality in shaping events. My goal was to create a coherent sense of the guests so the audience could understand who they were and how their unique mix of personality, intellect, and character came together to shape ideas that would affect the world. I explored the influence of parents, teachers, and events, the role of luck, and the consequences of setting. As these stories unfolded, I began to sense the strange mix of ingredients, often unplanned and unintended, that shaped these individuals and their distinctive contribution in fields as diverse as science, public policy, theory, art, journalism, political activism, and military affairs. Uh, uh, so, so this was where I was, and I'm just going to take a moment to give you two examples of things that happened in interviews. Uh, one was Oliver Stone. So uh, Stone came here. He was doing an event at journalism later in the day. I had written to him earlier and said I wanted to talk to him about history and the movies. And I, I was actually shocked when he, he, he said yes. So he, he came. He was late. He was very ruffled. and, and uh, uh, so we started the interview, and you can see this in the interview, and in preparation for the interviews, I watched all of his movies up until that time. And so, and I will read an excerpt a little later, I zeroed in on the question of his service. But the point is, as soon as he realized I was prepared, his whole demeanor changed. And you know, Oliver Stone is many things. One is, he's a very smart guy and, and something of an intellectual. And so there was a, a complete turnaround. Another example of how I would make discoveries in the course of studying, uh, one of the publishers sent me the former head of surgery at the University of Arizona. And uh, he uh, had written a book about uh, how medicine and science could not address all of the questions that were raised when a patient was healing themselves by relating to family, to friends, to the supernatural, or whatever. And uh, so in studying, the, the book was fascinating, it's a great read, uh, I noticed somewhere that he had taken a writing course with Rod Serling when he was an undergraduate at, in some, at one of the state universities in New York. So I said to him, I said, uh, and, and it, at the end of the interview and in the book, he tells this amazing story about an operation that was totally documented in, in Arizona where the brain was dis disconnected from the body uh, for 20 minutes. You know, and the person is completely hooked up, but the brain is here and the living body is over here. And uh, it, it, what, what happened was when the woman recovered, and woke up, she could re relate the conversation of the nurses uh, and the doctors in the room. And there's no scientific ev uh, explanation for this. And so <laughs> he was, we were walking through this story, and so then I said to him, did the fact that you had studied under Rod Serling, you know, make it easier for you uh, to write about this and to think about it? And he sort of looked at me with a quizzical look, and he said, I never thought of that. 
And so, so what, what I'm trying to say here is I'm making connections that aren't even in a person's consciousness when they know their own story. So as soon as we left the interview, he gets on his cell phone to call his wife, you know, to tell him what had come out in the interview, and it, it was such a, an obvious point. So then the final example I'll just use is, uh, w over the years, I've developed connections on the campus, a network of people, staff people, who really helped me locate people, get on their schedule, and so on. Uh, the graduate dean now is generously uh, supporting the, the cost of each interview that I do for all the prestigious lectures on, on the campus that the graduate division runs. And recently I interviewed a Japanese scientist uh, named Shikashi Toyoshima, who one day will probably win the Nobel Prize. Uh, and it, what he had done was uh, he was a tinkerer who knew how to play with electron microscopes. He's also a biologist and a physiologist. He's, he's a number of things. But he took a picture, which it was said could not be done, of uh, the brain sending a signal to a muscle uh, to, uh, open, to, to uh, open and co contract. And it's called the ion pump. That's all I will go into. But I ask him to explain his reaction to this discovery. And it's just amazing, you know, the, the, the moment of creativity and how he realized how small he was and so on uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the face of this, this universe. So those are the opportunities that, that present themselves and so on. So now let me talk to, about the book. I, I think I've told you, uh, I've given you a sense of how the craft evolved, how the techni uh, technology presented new opportunities, and I'm not a techie, and I, I was just given the opportunity to take advantage of them. So uh, I was approached by the new press, uh, and they, uh, Mark Favreau, the, the editor-in-chief, and they said they would like to do a book, and they suggested a title, Political Awakenings. Uh, and they gave me uh, an editor to work with, and, and, and uh, Priyanka Jacobs, she was, she was very gifted. And uh, uh, together, we saw, uh, uh, essentially I went through all my interviews, or thought about all of them, and uh, gave them 40, and then we winnowed it down to 20. Uh, Political Awakenings contains 20 interviews from the larger archive. This set of interviews was selected to capture the diversity of the people who, that by the power of their intellect and the strength of their character, make a difference in our ever-changing world. These, interviews came to, these interviewees came to see the world in a radically different way, with important implications for our world. They embraced ideas and actions that implied a different way of perceiving politics. politics Politics in this context means more than party affiliation. It refers to an understanding of power relations. The insights didn't just happen, but were the consequences of life experiences that helped clarify the way things held together moments of political awakening. Invariably, because of the interface between past and present, because of the limits and opportunities of their profession, or because of the interaction of different worlds, my guests were positioned to imagine alternatives to the conventional wisdom. A new way of seeing emerged in their thinking, in their writing, in their activism. With courage, perseverance, and determination, they took their ideas to a broader audience, and in so doing, uh, their world and the politics of the world were changed forever. Uh, and so that's what this collection is, and I'm gonna, there are 20 interviews, I'm gonna read a, a, a few uh, uh, excerpts from a few of the interviews, but I wanted to say that uh, what I learned was an interview is, and a video is very different than a book. And uh, what, what they helped me see was a focus. And a focus, I was in the same situation of some of my guests. I didn't see what the editor could see in what I was saying. What I did see was uh, I wanted to make sure that this was international. Uh, which I think I pushed them in that direction. So their P, their Sharina body is in here. Kenzabura Owe is in here, uh, 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 and others. Uh, uh, I wanted to not only have the '60s generation or you know the the more mature, but also younger people. So there is a uh, Nigerian environmental activist. Uh, here and here, Aranto Douglas, who strangely enough came through here several years ago. And 
Recently, there was a change of leadership in Nigeria, and now he's the top strategic advisor to the president of Nigeria. So, so the, the beauty in all of this is you're, you're getting people as they rise, where, you know, uh, 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 you're not just interviewing the Robert McNamara's who want to get a story out about what they did. You're also uh, uh, looking uh, uh, the other way. So, but I wanted to point out that, that the editor, Priyanka Jacob, uh, she saw something which, which I wouldn't necessarily see. So uh, she, she gave me uh, chapter headings. Uh, and so, and the two examples are things that I never would. So she created a chapter called Listening to the People. And in that chapter, she put Ron Dellums, makes sense, but she also put Elizabeth Warren. And Elizabeth Warren, which I will sort of explain, read an excerpt from her, it's perfect, because she did, she listened to the people through research, and that's how she has become such an influential figure. Uh, the other, uh, the other chapter heading that she came up was with the search for truth. Uh, and uh, in that chapter, let me see exactly if I've got the right, uh, it's, uh, Seeking truth, seeking truth. And in that chapter, she put Amira Haas of Haaretz Magazine, who does some of the best reporting on the situation in the occupation and has actually lived with the Palestinians, uh, and Jane Mayer, who writes for The New Yorker and exposed uh, uh, a lot of what was going on uh, with regard to torture. So let me, let me just show you, give you a sense of the book. Uh, the, we're going to sell some books uh, uh, shortly uh, when I conclude, but let me, let me just give you a sense uh, uh, of what the book is and, and, uh, uh, and what we've tried to do here. This is Elizabeth Warren who when I interviewed her in 2007, I didn't know who she was. That's the beauty of this. People ask me, well, who would you like to interview? Well, I don't know who I would like to interview. Uh, and and uh, what, what we have at Berkeley is several faculty committees that uh, pick prestigious guests or intellectual leaders to come to the campus. And because of the graduate dean, I'm able to interview these people, and also uh, Jane Go uh, Ellen Gobbler uh, uh, at uh, the graduate division puts them, me on their schedule. That is very important. You, you don't know how important it is to be put on somebody's schedule. And these faculty committees, you know, they sit around and, you know, I, I guess they're What's really interesting is they are able in their deliberation and their fights and their arguments to often come out, come up with guests who are sort of not just established but sort of at the threshold of knowledge in their fields. And Elizabeth Warren was an example of that. So I interviewed her, and fortunately, she was from Oklahoma. I'm from Texas, and so I could. And 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 she's a child of the Depression. Her parents, you know, suffered from the de uh, Depression. So she grew up, you know, in a world in which she knew what it was like when the middle class, you know, and and the middle class in the farming community lost everything. Uh, and so uh, I say, you started in commercial law, but then you moved to the public realm. How did that transition come about? I did my first empirical study looking at the families who were going into bankruptcy back in the 80s. And I'll tell you, I set out to prove they were all a bunch of cheaters. I was going to expose these people who were taking advantage of the rest of us by hauling off to bankruptcy and just charging off debts that they really could repay, or who, who'd, who'd have been irresponsible in running up these debts. I did the research and the data took me to a totally different place. These were hard-working middle-class families who by and large had lost jobs, gotten sick, had family breakups, and that what was driving them over the edge financially. Most of them were in complete economic collapse when they filed for bankruptcy. They would never pay those debts off. Realizing that changed my vision. Without this public policy component, she gets drawn into the public realm, the work would have been so sterile by comparison with what it turned out to be. Oh yeah, I'd have had great ideas on how 11 U.S.C. 1326 B2 should be modified in order to achieve a more harmonious result. But oddly enough, the political part ultimately enriched my understanding of the scopes of the problems. It took me far beyond bankruptcy and much more into questions about 
what's happening to the middle class? Often it was other people who would ask me the big questions. Why are families so much in debt? This is in 2007, before the crash. Who are these people who are filing for bankruptcy, they would ask me. Or sometimes it would simply be their allegations of fact. Well, we know it's just the poor and the profligate. That would cause me to say, Elizabeth Warren answers, oh, I've got to go back and study this some more. And so it was enriched and in many ways transformed the work that interested me as, as a scholar. And I think it's very important to understand all of this and now to understand the role that she's uh, now playing. Uh, I had the good fortune to uh, interview Tariq Ali several times, who is a person, he's a Pakistani, he's a radical, uh, but he knows more about Pakistan than I think anybody because he grew up as part of the elite structure there and then left it and, and went to, uh, to Oxford. Uh, and uh, so we're talking about how he was radicalized at Oxford during the Vietnam period. You went to Oxford. You were president of the Oxford Union. Tell us how your education at that time shaped your consciousness. So I arrived at Oxford, and here books which weren't available in Pakistan or had been removed from the libraries were suddenly available again. The atmosphere was very open, and I got engaged with left groups on the Oxford University campus very, very early on and became very active. The Vietnam War was at the beginning, and I was pretty obsessed by that war. It was my continent which was under attack. I knew we had to do something about it, and I got very engaged in helping to set up the anti-war movement in Oxford first and then nationally. When I did my final at Oxford, I had a bet with a friend that I would bring Vietnam into every single answer. He said, you can't do that. And I said, I will do it. He said, they won't give you a degree. And I said, I don't care. So I sat down and did that in philosophy, politics, and economics. One which drove my economics examiner nearly crazy was the question. Discuss the cheapest form of subsidized transport in the world. And I recall writing that the cheapest form of tra subsidized transport was the helicopter journeys made from Saigon into the jungle. I said the big tragedy was that office, the passengers didn't return. <laughs> Okay, Oliver Stone, uh, I, I described the situation when he came for the interview, and this was my question, and it, it provoked an extraordinary answer. And uh, subsequently, at this time, I was learning about the web and so on, and so I wrote to him and said, do you have photographs? And he sent me photographs from his Vietnam days, and there's a picture that we put there of him in a swamp as a Marine. And that, the, he, the, the expression on his face, you know, is explained by what he told me. What is quite amazing about Platoon and about Born on the Fourth of July, it's really the experience of the people, the soldiers who felt these decisions from the bottom up. Would you comment on that? And, and you know, this was a, kind of the point where he sort of sat up. That's probably perhaps one of the most significant things I've learned over there was that there's a sort of perceived life that you get when you're raised. College students get it. You read it in books. Your thinking is perception that you have been taught to you, very Pavlovian in a way. And when I got to the infantry, I really saw life smack up in front of my face. It was a non-cerebral -cere exercise. Six inches from my face, survive. You have to rely on your sense, your smell, your sight. All your senses come into play, tactile. As a re result, you never qu can get quite back. It's a question of what is authentic in your life, finally. What are you really feeling? How do you really feel about the way you are? How are you alive? What are you here for? Once you ask yourself these questions, they're all Socratic ones, I guess. Once you get into that arena, how do you go back into believing what they tell you? Uh, totally spontaneous answer. Uh, 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 another uh, example I want to give you is Kenzaburo Owe. Uh, Kenzaburo Owe was coming to Berkeley to give a prestigious lecture. I was told about his visit uh, it almost nine months in advance, so I set about reading everything that he had written. And he won the Nobel Prize for a book about uh, how the, the fictional character deals with the birth uh, of a, a brain-damaged child and uh, his decision to let the child live. And it, it harkens back uh, to his own life. 
Bird is the main, name of the main character. And going back and reading all this stuff, I did, found a collection of his essays and realized that at about the time his son was born, he had visited Hiroshima for the first time. And this provided an opening which led to a kind of very moving exchange. And uh, uh, so, but th in this brief segment, I want to, I said, uh, what you observe somehow at, at Hiroshima, in Hiroshima, uh, uh, sort of moved you to another plane in dealing with your own personal tragedy. The main character decides to let the child live. Uh, and so now he's talking about the doctor who was treating patients in Hiroshima. The doctor's name was Shigoda. And the reason I had stumbled onto this was in reading one of his novels about a year that he spent at Berkeley, his children were taken care of by a character who named Shigoto, the same name as this doctor. And I, so I made the connection and knew I had to pursue this. Yes, Shigeta said to me, we cannot do anything for the survivors, the Hiroshima survivors. Even today, we don't know anything about the nature of the illness of the survivors. Even today, so shortly after the bombing, we don't know anything, but we did what we could do. Every day, a thousand people did, but amidst the dead bodies, I continue. So, Kenzaburo, what can I do except that when they need our aid? Now your son needs you. You must find out that no one on this planet needs you except your son. Then I understood. I returned to Tokyo and began to do something for my son, for myself, and for my wife. And, and what is very moving in the interview is his son learned to, uh, to uh, talk in a very primitive way. And ultimately, he became uh, an award-winning uh, composer. And uh, uh, it's quite a story. The, we, we, I walk him through the moment of awakening of his son's uh, 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 speaking ability and where they, they realized what the potential of his intellect was. And in fact, when he was here, he went to Tower Records to buy a CD that his, uh, 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 the music that his son had composed. Okay, this will be the last one. Uh, I wanted to give you a flavor of the book and so on, and I, uh, I've taken a lot of time here. Uh, Howard Zinn, uh, who recently passed away, uh, and, uh, and I should say that uh, it's very interesting, these interviews that I have done uh, have become important remembrances of people as they pass away. And so I get calls from the New York Times when they don't, uh, uh, they want to know what I want to say about this person, basically. Of course, the New York Times didn't want to credit me when they, they quoted a, an unnamed historian at Berkeley, which I am not, three times in what, with regard to what Magnus, so I wrote them immediately and said, hey, you know, don't, don't credit the whole campus, you know, credit me, so they, they changed that. But, uh, they, uh, but uh, so uh, that's one example. Another example is, is uh, Ralph Derendorf. Uh, and uh, I just interviewed Neil Smelser again, a faculty member here, and Neil told me that when he was asked to do the obituary uh, for Derendorf, the best source was my interview, which you saw an excerpt from. So you don't, you, you know, it's really amazing. And then now in the case of Howard then this is, this is a story that people at Berkeley will appreciate. The New York Times did not have an official biography which they had written of Howard Zinn. You know, nobody has to say they have to agree with his politics, but that is really weird. So in the beginning, they ran an AP obituary, which was absolutely bizarre because you know they, they, they write these obituaries uh, in advance and so on. I think subsequently they did, but it, like in the first week they had nothing, which given the impact of his history books on young people, you know, uh, and I guess also on Hollywood, it, it's really quite extraordinary. 
Uh, so this is a, an excerpt from that interview. Before you were in college, you were working on the docks, and you were involved in a demonstration at Times Square, and the police attacked. In your autobiography, you wrote, henceforth I was a radical, believing that something fundamental was wrong in this country, not just the existence of poverty immense great wealth, yeah. not just the horrible treatment of black people, but something rotten at the root, requiring an uprooting of the old order, the introduction <laughs> of a new kind of society, cooperative, peaceful, egalitarian. So I say th that's an example of a kind of event that changed your thinking, and that's an argument that you make a lot of uh, in your history, that people can be changed by things that happen to them uh, and act accordingly. And this is Zinn's answer. That's right. Sometimes it's one vivid experience. Of course, it's never just one vivid experience, but it is that one experience coming on top of a kind of only semi-conscious understanding that's been developed. And then it became crystallized by an event. I think that's what happened to me at the age of 17, when I was hit by a policeman and knocked unconscious. He was a dock worker at the time. I woke up and said, my God, this is America, where yes, there are bad guys and there are good guys, but the government is neutral. And when I saw that, no, the police are not neutral, the government is not n uh, neutral, that was a radical insight. So that's the, uh, the book. I want to thank you. Now, I think we have books to sell here, so you can buy them, and I'll be happy to autograph them. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.